In the United States, most people are at least aware of what Jim Crow laws are, but not many people know how they came to be after the Civil War. Slaves were set free and given the right to vote during the Reconstruction pretty much immediately after the Civil War. How did Jim Crow laws even come about? Well, that's what I'm here to explain. How Reconstruction ended and the era of blatant African American oppression through the Jim Crow laws began. I should probably start by explaining what the Reconstruction era even was, so I will. But I must first explain that the Republican and Democratic parties during this era are completely different than they are now. Republicans were more liberal and dominated in the North, while Democrats used to be more conservative and dominated in the South. Which you may recognize is pretty much completely different from now. Anyway, now that that's out of the way, let's begin. Reconstruction technically started under Lincoln, but the first president to truly have an active role in the readmission of former Confederate states was Andrew Johnson. After Lincoln got, you know, Johnson was inaugurated. He pardoned all white men from the Confederate states who weren't Confederate leaders or plantation owners, though he individually pardoned most of those other guys. Johnson restored their rights and their property, except for their slaves of course, and Johnson also set the guidelines for the new former Confederate states' constitutions. That being the abolishment of slavery, not having the option to secede, and to forget all Confederate debt. Johnson didn't really give any other rules, so most of the states enacted laws that would limit African American economic opportunities so that they would have to return to plantations to work, because you know how you should respond after a civil war? To return to the status quo. Of course, that makes complete sense. In 1865, the Freedmen's Bureau was established and in 1866 extended, and many civil rights laws were passed. The Freedmen's Bureau gave medical and financial aid to millions of former slaves and anyone who was affected by the war, including many white people. Andrew Johnson sympathized with the Southerners, so he vetoed a lot of those bills. Thankfully, the Civil Rights Act still passed despite his veto and made it so anyone born on American soil is an American citizen, and that everyone, no matter their race, was equal under the law. Shortly after that, the 14th Amendment was added to the Constitution, enshrining the fact that anyone born in the US is an American citizen and that all citizens are equal under the law into the Constitution itself. The amendment did other things too, but we have other things to get to. Since Congress refused to seat former Confederate representatives or senators, Congress was dominated by Northerners, especially Republicans, who were able to pass bills into law despite Johnson's veto. So they decided to start Reconstruction all over again, but even harder this time. Eighteen sixty seven signaled the start of the Reconstruction era again by splitting up the Confederate states into five military districts and making sure that the new state governments ensured equality of all men especially when it comes to suffrage. 16 African Americans got elected to Congress as well as hundreds of state and local governments in the South during Reconstruction. Of course, not everyone was happy about this. Many Southerners were very upset with these changes. I mean, not even a decade ago, these people were owned by the white race and now they're voting, getting jobs, and being elected to serve in public office? They didn't like that. Thanks to Johnson still refusing many bills that would give land or give chances for African Americans to become more financially independent, many African Americans were still stuck and still faced an unjust system. The KKK was formed and many, many African Americans and their allies got murdered. In the election of 1868, Ulysses S. Grant, a Civil War hero, got elected to become president. Soon afterward, Congress approved the 15th Amendment, solidifying that no man could be refused the right to vote because of their race. Also, thanks to Johnson being voted out of power, Congress also got to enact laws that would clamp down on racial violence and rioting, even sending the military to take out the KKK in 1871. Obviously, that wasn't very successful, but I mean, they tried. Grant was easily re-elected in 1872. Sadly though, Congress started pulling back on many of its efforts. The Republican Party didn't look good after many of Grant's administration scandals came out and some Supreme Court decisions weakened the 14th Amendment. 
this left many states the chance to seize back white control over its politics. But Reconstruction wasn't over yet. It might have been weakened, but troops were still stationed in the South, and racial equality held out in some of the states. But by the election of 1876, Republicans were losing much of their control in the South and in Congress, which led to one of the first Democrats to actually have a chance in the presidential election in quite a while. The election of 1876 is one of the most controversial elections in U.S. history. It's also pivotal to the end of the Reconstruction era. The election was a race between Rutherford B. Hayes, the Republican nominee, and Samuel J. Tilden, the Democrat nominee. It was a very close race. Thanks to Grant's many scandals, the Republican Party was harmed. And thanks to the enactment of the Mississippi Plan, a plan to stop African American and Republican voters from voting through intimidation from racist Southern paramilitary groups like the Red Shirts and through economic coercion of, especially, poor African American farmers and sharecroppers, the Democrats were taking back control of the South. It seemed like the Democrat nominee Tilden might actually win. He had 184 electoral votes, just one vote short of the needed 185 votes to win the election. But four states had results that many saw as bullcrap. Those being one vote from Oregon, eight votes from Louisiana, seven votes from South Carolina, and four votes from Florida. History truly does repeat itself, doesn't it, Florida? Both parties thought that the votes belonged to them. So the states did a recount, and it turned out that Rutherford B. Hayes would have actually won the election. These results didn't really fan the flames at all, both sides debating and yelling even harder than before. Grant, who was still in office during the election, had to strengthen the military presence in Washington, D.C. because the protests and riots taking place from both sides got so violent. Congress, now facing an unprecedented crisis, passed a law on January 29, 1877 that created a 15-member electoral commission that would settle the dispute once and for all. The commission would include five representatives from the House, five senators, and five Supreme Court justices. From the House and Senate, there were five Republicans and five Democrats. For the justices, they started by choosing David Davis, an independent, a man whom neither side knew which candidate he preferred. They then picked two Republican and two Democrat Supreme Justices. Illinois thought it would be a great idea to ensure the Democrat victory by electing David Davis to become a senator buying his vote by giving him a seat in the Senate. What they didn't predict was the fact that David Davis resigned his position as a Supreme Court Justice and therefore his seat on the commission to give full attention to his role as a senator. Not only that, but the remaining justices were all Republican, so they had to just pick the least partial Republican justice. So the Democrats, in trying to pretty much buy a vote to win the election, shot themselves in the foot, letting the Republicans have a majority on the commission. What followed was the commission voting that every contested vote would go to Hayes. Hayes ended up with 185 electoral votes, the minimum required to win the election. Although Hayes lost the popular vote by 3%, many suspect that he would have won the popular vote if many African American and Republican voters in the South weren't too intimidated to vote. You've probably realized by now that the Democrats wouldn't take this sitting down. You're also probably wondering what this has to do with Reconstruction or Jim Crow, since I haven't mentioned those in a while. Well, both parties had a meeting behind closed doors to avoid a violent standoff. In the meeting, the Compromise of 1877 was born. It was an informal agreement. In exchange for getting Democrats to recognize Rutherford B. Hayes as the President of the United States, the Republican Party had to do five things. One, the United States would withdraw all federal troops from former Confederate states. Two, Hayes needed to appoint one Democrat to his cabinet. Three, they needed to start construction on a transcontinental railroad in the South. Four, they needed to draft legislation that would help industrialize the South. Without all those slaves working for free, farms and plantations have become much less profitable. And five, the Southern states would have the right to deal with African Americans without Northern interference. 
They promised they would respect their rights, but I think you can guess, they definitely didn't. That's how the Reconstruction Era ended, and how the Compromise of 1877 led to southern states creating Jim Crow laws and oppressing African Americans without any interference. Racism and oppression doesn't just end, especially not suddenly. The Civil War may have ended the institution of slavery, but it definitely didn't end racism or oppression. Far from it. Not even the Civil Rights Movement did that. Racism is ever-present in America, in its history and its politics, and you can't always count on public officials promising to fight for equality to actually reach it. Politics is a dirty game, and as long as it is, I doubt true equality will ever be reached. But we should do our best to get as close as humanly possible.